Okay, our second straight day without a comic introduction, and that's because eugenics, although it would be easy to write a comic introduction about eugenics, eugenics, which is our topic today, it's easy to be facile about it. I guess that facile and easy are the same thing in a way, Uh, but it's also, it's a darker topic uh, than maybe I had imagined, so we decided to play it straight. This is one of those shows, I love shows like this, where you feel like, I felt going into the show like I had some kind of grasp of this subject and what the word meant and, and how it had expressed itself in, in, in society, and I was wrong. Uh, it's so much more complicated and interesting, and um, to one degree or another in the early part of the 20th century, everybody was in on it. Like, the people you think of as the good guys were in on it, as well as the people you think of as the bad guys. I'm going to tell you all about that today and, and many other things besides, including some p- complicity here in Connecticut. We always love it when Connecticut turns out to have a dark, greasy stain on itself. So we'll be talking about some Connecticut complicity uh, a little bit later in the show. We want to sort of set, set up the framework and, and tell the fascinating story uh, of um, eugenics, particularly in the first part of the 20th century in the United States. And we have uh, two perfect guests to do that with us. Alex- Alexandra Minnis-Stern, a professor of American culture at the University of Michigan and author of Eugenic Nation, Faults and Frontiers of Better Breeding in Modern America. Uh, and uh, joining us by Skype, Adam Cohen, a former member of the New York Times editorial board and writer for Time magazine. He's now the co-editor of the National Book Review and the author of Imbeciles, The Supreme Court, American Eugenics, and the Sterilization of Carrie Buck. So, um, Alexandra Ministern, I'm going to um, have you kick things off. We know that we get this word in the latter part of the 19th century from Charlie Darwin's uh, half-cousin. Um, do we have, is there a working definition of eugenics that kind of fits all of the expressions of it? Well, there's not a working definition because it means many different things to many people across time and even today. Overall, though, if we want to give it a working definition for the purposes of this show, um, you know, it really involves applying scientific ideas from heredity and biology to humans to regulate reproduction and shape the body politique. And A corollary of that is choosing certain characteristics that are desirable and defining other characteristics and eliminating them in the ideas in the eyes of the eugenicists that are undesirable. So the more that I read about it, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed to me that although uh, it's it's more nuanced than this, that you could sort of say there are two tines in in the barbecue fork uh, of eugenics. One of them uh, is really sort of an expression of brute nativism that's very much tied to immigration patterns around the turn of the century in the early 1900s. Uh, It's the tine or or the part of the fork that gets you eventually uh, into Nazi Germany. But uh, here in America, there's just kind of this sense that there are these uh, fast breeding uh, lower classes uh, and we need to do something about that before the the race gets watered down. Here's what we're going to do. And then there's this other tine that really is more, you know, these people who believe in an intersection of science and society, who, who've identified maybe in a very paternalistic and not very diverse way um, problems that they think science uh, and science in the shape of genetics could possibly uh, um, solve, that we could get rid of some of the things that plague humankind. Um, and and though, though they may be kind of paternalistic, they're they're not the same people as the the first people I talked about. Am I wrong about that? Or I mean, there are there kind of two different subsets of this? Um, well, people like to talk about scholars and uh, like to talk about eugenics in kind of two ways: the positive eugenics, which is about reproduction of the fit, and in the United States, often focused on the white middle class or kind of white nativism. And then the elimination or lowering the reproduction of the unfit. And that is where you get into more exclusionary measures, which could be both eugenic segregation, putting people into institutions, sterilization. You could also put immigration law, immigration bans and restriction in that category. There are heterogeneous, it's a very heterogeneous movement Um, that the eugenicists were extremely heterogeneous. If you look from state to state, there were very different participants from state to state. What they all shared, I think, is what you covered at the end, which is this belief that science could provide the clues, the tools to solving social problems, 
in a fairly neat and nicely packaged way. So, Adam Cohen, um, whatever people may think about uh, eugenics, it seems almost indisputably true that uh, maybe an Englishman coined the word, and maybe the Nazis uh, had the most toxic expression of it. But eugenics, everything that we're talking about, is is grown in the fertile soil of the United States of America in the early part of the 20th century, right? We're the ones who kind of uh, opened up the game. We were the leaders in it. And uh, as you say, it did begin in England with uh, a relative of Charles Darwin, who took Darwinian ideas and began to apply them to human beings. Um, But when it came to America, these ideas, it actually came at a very opportune time for these ideas to take hold. Um, uh, America in the beginning of the 20th century was actually in a state of some anxiety. There were high immigration rates, sounds a little bit like today. The nation was changing quickly, uh, industrialization, people moving from the farms to the cities. So um, it was an anxious moment, anxious for the middle class, anxious for Anglo-Saxon indigenous uh, groups. And eugenics gave them a way to think about pushing back against all this scary progress. And yes, it was adopted very widely. It was talked about in the mass magazines and mass books. It was taught at over 300 universities. And more than half of the states adopted eugenic sterilization laws to actually sterilize people to advance the cause of eugenics. We should say uh, Connecticut was number two in the queue. I think Indiana uh, got there first. Um, And so you have thousands uh, of people, Adam, uh, being sterilized uh, for this reason. Um, uh, Let's maybe just very quickly in in a a thumbnail sketch out uh, the case that's cited in the title of your book. This is the case uh, of Carrie Buck. Yeah, so Carrie Buck was a uh, poor white uh, young woman from Charlottesville, Virginia. She was taken in by a foster family that treated her terribly, and she got pregnant as a result of a rape. And rather than helping her, the family decided we need to get rid of her. So they have her hauled before a so-called commission on feeble-mindedness, and they get this commission to declare her epileptic, which she was not, she never had a seizure in her entire life, and feeble-minded, which was a very loose category used to apply to people who either were not doing well in IQ tests or were uh, sexually promiscuous if they were women, or a whole checklist of different factors that the middle-class judges were not happy with. So she's declared to be epileptic and feeble-minded, shipped off to the colony for epileptics and feeble-minded, given an IQ test when she gets there, which is just a ridiculous test that didn't test intelligence, declared to be a middle-grade moron. And it was her misfortune that she got there right after Virginia had passed one of these eugenic sterilization laws. In the state of Virginia, unlike some other states, which were just immediately sterilizing people as soon as they passed a law, they had decided they were going to create a test case and get the law upheld by the courts before they applied it. So they were looking for a a victim, so to speak, to bring this test case um, so they could work it through the, the courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. They choose Carrie Buck. They give her a lawyer to nominally represent her, but it's actually a former chairman of the Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded, uh, not on her side. Her case does go up through the courts, up to the Supreme Court, becomes this case of Buck versus Bell, um, and uh, she's she's the Buck, Carrie Buck. And this is the case that establishes that laws like Virginia's, and again, more than half of states had them, were constitutional, and people like Carrie Buck could be sterilized on the basis of a completely unreliable IQ test. And I believe, rather heartbreakingly, uh, or uh, image puncturingly, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes writes this decision? Yeah, the great Oliver Wendell Holmes, who many think of as you know maybe the greatest justice in Supreme Court history, not only writes the decision, but writes a particularly cruel opinion in which he says three generations of imbeciles are enough. That's sort of the famous phrase, talking about Carrie, her mother, who was also at the colony, and the baby that she gave birth of as a result of rape, although none of these people really seem to be imbeciles at all. Um, And then actually in this decision for an eight to one court, urges the other states who haven't already done it to adopt eugenic laws and says we need to stop this tide of incompetence that is sweeping over the land. And it's it's surprising that it was Holmes because he's so well-regarded, but another way it's not because Holmes was a great New Englander, right? He was born into a bunch of Boston Brahmin families. In fact, his father, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., the dean of Harvard Medical School, coined the phrase Boston Brahmin. And 
Oliver was raised, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. was raised to believe that he was of a superior breed. The Olivers, the Wendells, and the Holmes, all, all Brahmin families. He, his mother was a descendant of the Lowells. He was raised to believe that these people's blood was actually better. They were better than the common New Englanders. And lo and behold, when he's on the Supreme Court and Carrie Buck comes along and says, help, they're trying to sterilize me because they think that I'm inferior because of my blood. Well, Oliver Wendell Holmes agrees. He thinks that people like him are better than her, and he's happy to have her sterilized. So, um, Alexandra um, Minister, you know, I mean, it's obviously very disturbing to read this about uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, but the more that I read, the more I seemed to find, or the more it seemed to me, that kind of everybody was in on this, this at some level. At this point in history, you know, whether it's Teddy Roosevelt or Herbert Hoover or Winston Churchill or George Bernard Shaw or H.G. Wells or you know, people that you really like, at some point or another, they seem to have kind of bought into at least some piece of this puzzle. It just wasn't a dirty word yet, was it? No, the dirty word doesn't come till after World War II. And I think, you know, pulling out some from uh, some of what Adam said, you know, Oliver Wendell Holmes, when he makes that decision, he draws precedent from a case, Massachusetts versus Jacobson, which is a case about the state's um, authority to enact compulsor compulsory vaccination in that, in, from 1906, in that instance, for smallpox. And well, he draws on that case, and basically what he says is, just as the state, you know, for the case of the common good and public health, has the right to insist on compulsory vaccination, the state has the authority and the right and really the duty to protect the public health to enact compulsory cutting of the fallopian tubes. My point there is that this is really seen as a key aspect of public health prevention, bolstered by some of the anxieties at the time that the white middle class was feeling, and particularly a strand or a kind of a section of uh, white middle class professionals and scientists and reformers. So it was embraced, you know, in 32 out of 48 states, because Hawaii and Alaska weren't states yet, had sterilization laws on the books. The first, as you mentioned, was passed in Indiana in 1907, really kind of fortified by the agricultural context of that state where those who passed the sterilization law said, if we can breed better cows and better pigs and better corn, well, why can't we breed better people? And then, you know, state by state, these laws were passed until the final one was passed by Georgia in 1937. Um, so over the course of those 30 years, 32 states passed laws and about, it's hard to get the precise statistics, but somewhere in the range to 60 to 65,000 eugenic sterilizations occur over the course of the 20th century based on those laws. Um, Alexandra, I want to ask you uh, about one particular guy who I kept reading about and who uh, began to fascinate me. His name is uh, Madison Grant. Uh, he is, in other parts of his life, an important conservationist. Uh, he helped save the bison. He helped found the Bronx Zoo. Um, but while he's doing I think he's got two California state parks named after him. I think that's in your book. Uh, and But meanwhile, he's he's this virulent racist who really has a nativist who really has who's using terms that alarmingly do sound like they could have come out of you know the sort of Breitbart Richard B. Spencer uh, parts of, of 2017 he talks about the great mass of worthless Jews and Syrians who are flooding our cities and he writes this book called The Passing of the Great Race that, that turns out to be kind of an ur text for this brand of eugenics uh, Hitler sends him a fan letter and calls it my bible um, but once again Alexander this guy he was in some little rat scurrying around in a corner. He he was a very mainstream figure. Well, yeah. I mean, now we can look back on him and kind of call him fringe. But at the time, he was very much in the mix of the prominent eugenicists. He partook of the kind of scientific racism that they all trafficked in at the time, very concerned about, um, you know, undesirable immigration, very wedded to the idea of building up a kind of Nordic or Anglo race used very vitriolic language in both his books, The Passing of the Great Race and the Conquest of America book that he wrote. And um, just as, you know, an aside, the Richard Spencer has written kind of a homage to Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, and kind of reveres it as an important tract in kind of the history of the alt-right. So, you know, it is relevant today um, in that way, shape, and form. But yeah, he was one of, you know, 
By the 30s, though, you know, some of the more level-headed eugenicists, let's say, especially those that embrace this idea of reform eugenics after World War II, really began to distance themselves from that kind of virulent racism. But that doesn't mean that eugenics goes away. It means that it's kind of repackaged in other ways, and the American Eugenics Society continues to exist until the early 1970s. But yeah, he was very popular in the early 20th century. By the 40s, with the advent also of cultural anthropologists who are kind of questioning his approach, people are pushing back on that type of racism. The Carnegie Foundation defunds the Eugenics Records Office in 1939 because its superintendent, Harry Laughlin, is kind of thinks along a similar vein as Madison Grant. So there is some pushback um, against him, but those tracks are quintessential tracks of the early 20th century movement. And I will just mention that one of the things that's often hard to kind of connect the dots is, well, what is the relationship between Madison Grant and some of those early environmentalists and eugenics? And really, they uh, their ideas about preservation and about good species and alien species and native species, they kind of moved back and forth between plants and trees and wildlife and humans in the way that they applied those. So if you think about in terms of his ideas about species classification and who's good and bad and should be progressing and, you know, what kind of species should be removed, you can get a better sense of, okay, that's the relationship between his idea about eugenics applied to humans and how he could love, have loved the California redwoods. Right. I'm going to say he uh, found it easy to toggle between bisons and Brahmins. Uh, so, um, Adam Cohen, um, you know, when we hear about a case like the Carrie Buck case, uh, we assume that this was something in the distant past that has no particular uh, uh, cor- correlative in, in, in any recent time. But, you know, did this decision, the Supreme Court decision, did it ever get struck down? It hasn't been struck down. And in fact, uh, the Supreme Court had an opportunity to strike it down in 1941, and they chose not to. Uh, it's been cited by federal courts more recently, uh, including in the 2000s. And it remains good law today. So if uh, we were to get a uh, new eugenics law passed somewhere, under current law, the Supreme Court would uphold it. Um, so it's definitely a concern, and uh, and as I say, they had an op- the Supreme Court had an opportunity to overturn it, and one of the justices on that court said we we did not want to overturn it. We wanted to limit some of the applications, but we want to be able to uh, uphold laws like this. And and I, I would just you know there seem to be cases of these kinds of sterilizations performed without the knowledge or God knows the consent of the sterilizee going at least into the 1970s in North Carolina, right? That's true. And in fact, yeah, the last eugenic sterilization was actually in the early 1980s in in Oregon. Um, Yeah, um, as Alexandra rightly said, the uh, World War II did slow down the eugenics movement, but it's actually striking the degree to which it has persisted. Yes. So there are cases in uh, in North Carolina, in Virginia, other states into the 60s, 70s and yeah, even early 80s. Um, um, and as Alexander said, there's some talk right now on the alt-right about eugenic ideas. So one has to be concerned that the law has not moved beyond these concepts. Um, I just also, before we um, go back to Alexander for a second, Adam, one more thing, which was, because I don't think we really emphasized this enough, um, the, ba- the certification of people like Carrie Buck for uh, as people who fell into whatever group of categories we're talking about here, and we are talking about people who were called feeble-minded back then, or but it could have been prisoners or deaf people or minority people. I mean, there are all kinds of ways in which people kind of got pre-selected for this, but it often seemed to be on a kind of sketchy basis, like, you know, so-and-so is promiscuous and we know this because, or, or maybe even certified by a doctor who'd never even seen the patient, just was sort of looking at, at a report and going, yeah, yeah, that's the kind of person we sterilize. Yeah, no, absolutely true. And, you know, one of the problems is that these statutes, which were passed in most states, had their own categories. It varied from state to state, but they were often very vague categories and certainly categories one wouldn't associate with being unworthy to reproduce. So uh, people who were considered to be idle or indolent, you know, lazy, uh, poor. In some states, if you were poor, that would be could be grounds for eugenic sterilization. Um, and then certainly the range of disabilities uh, as well, blindness and so forth. So um, 
so some of these categories, as you might imagine, are, are quite uh, hard to pin down who exactly is an idle person. Um, but then even taking feeble mindedness, the category uh, that that was sometimes associated with low intelligence, incredibly vague. And the IQ tests of the time were so deficient. Uh, I saw the test that was given to Carrie Buck when she was uh, admitted to the colony for epileptics and feeble minded. And the questions were things like, what do you do when a playmate hits you? Well, it's hard to know what the answer is to that that's correct or not correct uh, uh, to the level that it should categorize you as being uh, feeble-minded and perhaps make you eligible to be sterilized as a result. So that is the kind of incredible vagueness, uncertainty, and you know, often discrimination that we were dealing with in these categorizations. So Alexandra, I guess one question that I have was uh, is, you know, I mean, as we move along through the decades uh, of the 20th century, whether or not it is possible to be essentially pure of heart and noble of spirit and yet still subscribe to some of the tenets of eugenics. And, and maybe one of the people I have in my mind is Margaret Sanger. You know, Margaret Sanger is often unfairly targeted by, uh, by conservatives. Uh, and this whole thing has been fact-checked to death, that the notion that Planned Parenthood was initially, initially founded to suppress the reproduction of minorities. But, my, but Margaret Sanger, to a certain degree, did believe that genetic science could could be used to limit certain kinds of uh, diseases or dysfunctions uh, in a way that, I don't know, some of her quotes make me a little bit uncomfortable. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I'd like to start off by saying is that it's helpful for me, you know, one of the ways I think about eugenics across this long, you know, 100 years is from really about the early 20th century to the, let's say, the 1960s or 70s when the eugenics, uh, American Eugenics Society folds, there's something that we can think of that would be eugenics with a capital E. It's actually eugenics movement. There are eugenics organizations. People pay their dues. They have annual meetings. They publish their journals and, and you know, do all of those kinds of things that we would associate with a movement. Now, that movement is strongest, you know, from this period of about 1910 to 1950, let's say. But, you know, it lasts until the 70s. After that, we get some, you know, market shifts in American society in the 1970s, both the kind of lag effects of the civil rights movement, the feminist health movements, the rise of bioethics, ideas of patient autonomy, kind of the idea that people with disabilities have, you know, bodily rights and that women have reproductive rights and so on and so forth. And so then I like to think of kind of eugenics with a lowercase e and eugenic impulses that we can find in a variety of different places that intersect with issues related to disability, related to reproduction, related to race, and so on. So that, for me, is kind of a helpful way of kind of thinking of it chronologically. In terms of Margaret Sanger, yeah, Margaret Sanger had certain ideas about who should be giving birth and who shouldn't be giving birth. She did ally herself strategically with eugenicists in a way because eugenicists had clout at the time, and she wanted to tap into some of that clout. So I think it was a mixture of both a strategic alliance that she made at a time when birth control, as you know, was under severe regulations and you could be punished for using it and, you know, it was very paternalistic in terms of women getting access to birth control and sterilization, for that matter, um, if they wanted it voluntarily. Um, and she also did have ideas about class and race and, you know, subscribe to, you know, a certain type of um, white middle class ideas of, that white middle class families were more desirable. However, I think that, you know, looking back in time, it's important, yes, to recognize that and to put her in her historical context, but she was not the total sum of the birth control movement, the contraception movement, or the reproductive rights movement. She was one facet of it at a time when a lot of different things were swirling around, and I'm not trying to be an apologist for what she did, but nonetheless, I think when you put it in historical perspective, and you also look at some of the projects that she did in African-American communities to set up birth control clinics that later were um, you know, run and managed by those very communities, you know, you begin to get a more nuanced picture of her. But yeah, it's important to recognize that and to say, okay, well, what do we do about that? And what does that mean? What it means is that, you know, for women to get access to reproductive health services and reproductive rights in that era, 
they got up entangled often with the eugenics movement because the eugenics movement was very concerned with reproduction. And it was often the white middle class men, although there were some women, um, who were kind of controlling those strings, both the purse strings and also, you know, kind of the medical aspects of it as well. All right, we're going to grab a break here. We're talking right now to Alexandra Minister,n a professor of American culture at the University of Michigan and the author of Eugenic Nation, Faults and Frontiers of Better Breeding in Modern America, and Adam Cohn, uh, who's the author uh, of Imbeciles, The Supreme Court, American Eugenics, and the Sterilization of Carrie Buck. We're going to talk about the dark, greasy stain on Connecticut's escutcheon uh, after this. All right, we're back. We're talking about eugenics, which turns out to be a more fascinating and disturbing uh, history than, than I had realized. And obviously we know that it's fascinating and we know that it's very disturbing. Uh, we haven't, we've sort of alluded to it repeatedly, but it's, its most toxic expression came when the Nazis got hold of it and everything that had happened in America in terms of cel- uh, sterilization, you can start adding zeros onto it and then they just stopped bothering with sterilization and started killing people. Uh, we'll come to that uh, a little bit uh, later. Um, right now, we want to talk about Connecticut. We always like to think that Connecticut is a nice place where people don't do bad things, but of course, of course Connecticut is pretty much like everywhere else. Uh, so joining us right now, along with Alexandra and Adam, we have Bob Farwell, uh, who is the executive director of the Otis Library in Norwich, Connecticut, where they're, they've been looking uh, at this whole question. So, Bob Farwell, first of all, welcome to our conversation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've alluded to the fact that Connecticut was second in America to b- get a law on the books that allowed this kind of thing, this compulsory form of sterilization for certain groups of people. So where did that wind up being practiced? Who, who actually wind up taking advantage of that law, if that's the right way to put it? Yeah, I probably wouldn't be my choice of words, but anyhow, the 1909 law, there were originally two locations that were entitled to inflict sterilizations. The first two were the state hospitals for the insane in Middletown and Norwich, and that eventually extended to the prison at Weathers Field and then the Mansfield Training School and Hospital at uh, Mansfield Depot, the latter in Mm. 1919. So they all at one time or another were uh, empowered to make decisions about sterilization. Once again, you know, we're talking about uh, talking to Adam about it in the 70s and early 80s it happening in other parts of the country. But in Connecticut, it seems to have gone at least into the 1960s, right? Yep. Something in the neighborhood of, uh, of 557, 600 people mm-hmm. who were considered insane or mentally handicapped were sterilized between 1909 and 1963. And once again, I, I want to come back to this idea of how... I mean, it, there just wasn't a rigorous vetting process or really a set of boxes that had to be checked off for every single person. This was kind of a ballpark estimate, right, of, uh, of who yeah. warranted this kind of handling. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, uh, well, I was, I was reading recently one of, the, uh, one of the publications circulated by the Eugenics Record Office at Cold Spring Harbor, New York, entitled The Hill Folk. And, of course, there was supposed to be a a rigorous series of procedures that these field agents had been trained to do. But when you read their notes, how they assess the the, the mental and physical capacities of the people that they were studying, oftentimes what it comes down to is innuendo, you know, gossip, inferences drawn by current generations, about things that happened in past generations. So the rigor got lost there somewhere in in translation. And so, actually, let me bring Alexandra back into the conversation. He mentioned uh, Cold Spring Harbor. That's your friend, uh, Dr. Laughlin, uh, I believe. And, And, I mean, once again, this is kind of an interesting and disturbing categorization of people that that people more or less because of where they lived and how they lived, they were hill people, that 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 might qualify them for this kind of treatment? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, eugenicists were obsessed with classification. So one of the things that Charles Davenport, also of the Eugenics Records Office, 
um, puts one of the first things he publishes is something called the trait book, which has hundreds and hundreds of traits, which ostensibly come through Mendelian inheritance, and they can be dominant or recessive. And they include things from alcoholism to feeble-mindedness to love of the sea to a whole variety of things that are kind of more expected and also truly bizarre. Um, and so eugenicists, in order to decide who was desirable and who was undesirable and to determine, you know, how to enact their policies, needed to classify people. So there was all this energy put into classification. On the other hand, when you get to the actual implementation of the deciders, who is going to be institutionalized, who is going to be sterilized, the way that those were implemented was often very subjective. And you can find that out by going back and looking at the records, which one of the things that my research team has been doing is we've been going very carefully through 20,000 sterilization recommendations from the state of California, processed from 1919 to 1952. And we can see that kind of um, you know, complex dynamic and the back and forth between, you know, this attempt to be hyper-scientific and to classify people's exact IQ score and to rank them and to check off the box that justified their sterilization. On the other hand, to provide very sloppy kind of characterizations of, you know, entire families going back generations and just assuming because one, you know, 17-year-old was, you know, had an IQ of 62 and was considered a moron, that her brother must necessarily also be, you know, an idiot or must be feeble-minded. So, yes, it's, you know, they they had their cake and they ate it too in that regard. Right. I mean, some of the stuff that, Bob, you sent us, you know, descriptions of somebody as a wild, immoral fellow. Mm. Good enough. So um, tell us, uh, people in southeastern Connecticut who want to explore a little bit more of this, you, there is something still at the um, Otis Library, some kind of um, exhibit? Yeah, well, we have a, it, currently we have a traveling exhibit that is sponsored by the Smithsonian, and it's uh, entitled Human Origins, uh, What Does It Mean to Be Human? The research on eugenics was sort of a segue into answering answering that question in one fashion, which is you know the 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 drive to come up with a more perfected humanity, and uh, that's how we got interested in pursuing this and looked uh, looked further into the information that was extant about the Norwich State Hospital, particularly, but also some of the other engagements that Connecticut had with the uh, with the eugenics movement. So, Bob, you know, one of the, the themes here is that, you know, anybody in history uh, that you liked uh, from the early part of the 20th century, if you're going to make eugenics a deal breaker, you're going to have to break up uh, historically with that person. I happen to be a big fan of former Connecticut Governor Wilbur Cross. I love his yeah. famous Thanksgiving Day proclamation. Unfortunately, Bob, according to you, Wilbur Cross is somebody who uh, at least kind of fell into the trap or the fad or the vogue for yeah, this kind of thinking. He- I, I, you know, I will, I, I, I think I give him the benefit of the doubt, probably on on this, but uh, certainly, when a legislative committee during your tenure in, as governor is hiring Harry Laughlin to come up with a plan for um, for helping those folks who are considered, you know, to use the the. Uh, you know the, the sort of the, uh, the 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 terms of the time, uh, mental defectives and diseased and beset with allied problems. When you hire somebody like that to help guide your research, you know it's pretty pretty you know pretty well what you're going to get, and it's not going to be pretty, and it's likely to be uh, highly uh, highly uh, destructive to uh, to your to your service population. All right. Well, Governor Cross, we need to talk about that. Uh, Bob Farwell is the executive director of the Otis Library in Norwich. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. I want to go switch back over to Adam Cohen for a second, because as long as we're uh, talking about complicity, as long as we're talking about revered institutions, some of them in Connecticut, one of them which I graduated from, let's talk, uh, Adam Cohen, about Ivy League institutions, notably Yale and Harvard. What, what is their role in all this? They were the intellectual leaders of the eugenics movement, uh, no question about that. Um, Yale had a uh, very prominent economics professor, Irving Fisher, who was a leading eugenicist. But it was really Harvard University that was, in many ways, the brain trust of the eugenics movement. And uh, I actually wrote an article for Harvard Magazine about this, about the role that Harvard's genetics department played in writing 
genetics textbooks that promoted eugenics in giving it uh, a very uh, high-level imprimatur. And some of Harvard's most famous names, people that, you know, the Wilbur Crosses of Massachusetts were also very involved in eugenics. So uh, President Lowell, uh, for whom Lowell House, one of the undergraduate houses, is named, he was a uh, supporter of eugenics. And uh, um, and another prominent pre president of Harvard, President Eliot, also there's a house named after him. He was a supporter of eugenics and actually wrote an academic article advocating for eugenic sterilization. So um, in Harvard Magazine, I argued that Harvard University as a whole should do more to acknowledge its role as uh, really being a thought leader in eugenics. But yes, Yale University also, the first president of Stanford was a major eugenicist, and over 300 uh, colleges and universities around the country were teaching eugenics. And this was in many ways a top-down movement, and intellectual leaders in all of these places were promulgating the idea that eugenics was scientifically correct and winning followers, you know, throughout the country. All right, so we're going to grab a break. We're going to come back with more of Alexandra, more of Adam. We're going to talk about whether or not there are echoes in the present moment of some of the things that we've been talking about. I think you already know the answer to that question. And we'll also talk about ways in which the whole notion of the designer baby uh, is a, a different kind of expression of eugenics. Don't labor that hard. Today's show was produced by Josh Nalea and me, Kyone Wolf. Our intern is Ali Oshinsky, and the part of Bill Curry was played by H.G. Wells. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and other platforms. And now, back to Colin. All right, so uh, we're talking to Alexandra Minister-Stern. I'm not going to give you her whole title. Uh, the book is Eugenic Nation, Fault and Frontiers of Better Breeding in, in Modern America. Also, Adam Cohen, uh, his relevant book is Imbeciles, the Supreme Court, American Eugenics, and the, Steriliz the Sterilization of Carrie Buck. Well, you know, it might be listening to all this stuff, and you might be thinking, well, yeah, but it's 2017. Does anybody still believe this crap? I mean, anybody in a position of power, for example? When you connect two racehorses, you usually end up with a fast horse. The secretariat doesn't produce slow horses. You have to have the right, the right genes. I have a certain gene. I'm a gene believer. Do we believe in the gene thing? I mean, I do. I have a great genes and all that stuff, which I'm a believer in. Well, I think I was born with a drive for success. I was born with a certain intellect. The fact is, you have to be born and blessed with something up here. You're born a fighter, and I've seen a lot of people, they want to fight, but they can't. Some people cannot genetically handle pressure. I always said winning is somewhat maybe innate. Maybe it's just something you have. You know, you have the winning gene. Frankly, it'd be wonderful if you could develop it, but I'm not so sure you can. You know, I'm proud to have that German blood. There's no question about it. Great stuff. Rot row. Um, so Alexander Ministern, I mean, obviously we know who that is, and, and surrounding him are people like Steve Bannon, uh, from Bright, formerly of Breitbart, who's on the record about a certain, or at least who has been, I guess on the record is the wrong way to put it, uh, maybe it's the wrong way to put it, uh, and then below that we have Richard B. Spencer, uh, uh, people who are part of the alt-right movement that seems to traffic in some of these ideas. I don't know, you immersed yourself in the rhetoric of, say, 1909. Uh, how different or how similar is 2017? Well, as I mentioned before, um, Richard Spencer, you know, and at least one segment of those in the alt-right really revere Madison Grant and some of those early eugenicist texts insofar as they are positing and looking towards the creation of a, what we they call, or we could call a white ethnostate, and that's the language they like to use. Um, you know, those texts are full of anti-Semitic racist language um, that is about conquest. It's very masculinist. Um, what I, when I talk about President Trump's approach to it, at least what I've heard in the rhetoric, it's very much of this thoroughbred approach to thinking about breeding and thinking about superiority. And it does definitely, you know, have deep resonances with the kind of scientific racism and the ideas of genetic superiority that reach back decades and decades. Um, I do want to make one point, though, before we move on that I don't want to leave out of this conversation. One of the things that is distinct from U.S. sterilization laws versus Germany's law is that 
the U.S. laws never targeted a specific racial or ethnic group. Mm -hmm. They really were more about targeting disability, often defined in these loose ways, as we've talked about. But the way that they were enacted often ended up affecting certain racial and ethnic groups more than others. So they burdened disproportionately, particularly in several states like North Carolina and California, fell on Latinos or African Americans. So they were enacted in racist ways. And I think it's important not to forget that because it shows the ways in which these ideas about disability and difference then intersect with racism in this control of reproduction that is sterilization. Um, but in terms of your question, I think that there are contemporary manifestations of eugenics and the recent election has put those on the table in very disturbing ways that require a lot of attention. Um, there also are discussions that you mentioned before around, you know, this designer babies or what we might call commercialized eugenics. That's no longer the heavy hand of the state that we're talking about, which is, you know, either the U.S. Supreme Court or 32 states that enacted these laws and people who were institutionalized against their will, but really people making choices and people who have, you know, uh, the ability and maybe the resources to use certain reproductive and genetic technologies and tests to make selections before Im implantation of an embryo or something like that. So that that's a whole other area that gets into, you know, the complex intersections of you know, kind of patient autonomy and reproductive rights and also, you know, discriminatory ideas towards people with disability, for example, Down syndrome and so on. So, Adam Cohen, we've managed to, I think, uh, give a good whacking to every Boston Brahmin I can think of, except for many, maybe Henry Cabot Lodge, but he was part of this restrictionist movement that uh, showed up in the 1924 Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which was, once again, heavily linked to this notion of um, keeping certain gene lines pure, uh, to this whole notion uh, of eugenics. How many echoes do you hear from 1924 in the echo chamber of the past weekend and the executive order that was signed? Yeah, quite a few. And the 1924 Act is really fascinating part of the eugenic history because I think a lot of people don't realize the extent to which that important uh, immigration law, which really transformed immigration throughout the 20th century, was done for eugenic reasons. Harry Laughlin, who we've mentioned a few times before, um, had what testified before Congress in favor of the law for eugenic reasons. Uh, the Congress members talked about eugenics on the uh, floor of Congress. And, uh, and there were certain countries that they thought would bring in good genes and certain certain countries they thought would bring in bad genes. And one thing that I write in my book, I was just, you know, really stunned to, to, to think about was, um, you know, it came out in the 1990s that uh, Anne Frank's father wrote to the State Department asking for visas for his family, and he was turned down. Um, and as a result of being turned down, uh, they were caught. And Anne Frank, of course, died in a concentration camp in Bergen-Belsen. Um, so we think about Anne Frank dying in a concentration camp because the Nazis thought that the Jews were genetically inferior. We don't think so much about the fact that she died in a concentration camp, also because the US Congress did, and it passed a law that kept people like her out. So very sobering stuff. And yeah, um, we're beginning to hear, you know, resonances of that again. Uh, certainly, you know, people have a lot of different reasons for opposing or uh, supporting immigration, but it's not hard to hear, you know, some rumblings of, you know, this is the kind of person we want to come in and help you know, form our nation, and this isn't the right kind of person. So um, I think we all need to be very attentive to that and think about how much of that is driving things like the executive order, like um, just ver a variety of, uh, you know, uh, ideas out, out now to, you know, scale back immigration. You know, why are we doing it? And, you know, what are, what are the real motives? So, um, Alexander, let's go back to these uh, designer babies. Um, we can talk um, about, and we will talk about sort of ways in which it becomes a kind of uh, boutique uh, in which you, you can start maybe trying to select for things that, that seem pretty discretionary as opposed to vital. But, you know, there are single gene diseases uh, with repairable mutations, um, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease. There are anemias like sickle cell anemia, certain cancers. You know, if, if we start doing prenatal testing for those and, and either try to fix them using something like CRISPR or, uh, or just uh, genetic diagnosis and, and embryo selection, is that eugenics? Well, before I jump into that, let me just add to what Adam was saying, that uh, component of that 1924 National Origins Act was also the creation of the Border Patrol. Mm. 
And the logic around the creation of the Border Patrol is very similar to some of the rhetoric we're seeing around the need to construct a wall, to militarize a wall, to keep Mexicans out, and so on and so forth. So Mm -hmm. there's a, a connection there. But, you know, what you're talking about really is this slippery slope, and that's where we need to bring in issues of bioethics and justice and think about how those are going to inform how people um, use these technologies. Well, first of all, there's a question of who has access to them. So you can get kind of stratification in that some people can afford to use them. A lot of these um, technologies and, um, you know, treatments are, you know, out of pocket for people. Insurance won't cover them. So first of all, who has access to them? And then what are people using them for? And ultimately, what is the outcome? So I think many of us could agree that, you know, there are certain um, severe diseases and really devastating conditions and, you know, people should be able to use and science should advance so that those conditions can be identified and, you know, um, they can be part of the process of reproduction for a couple about, you know, in terms of embryo selection and things like that. And that's within people's right and purview if they have the ability to do that to do so. The question is, once you start getting into characteristics or things that might fall under the realm of behavioral genetics, you know, what kind of a world are we creating? I mean, I think that's in what um, the previous guest, Bob Farwell, was talking about in terms of what does it mean to be human? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we do know that, you know, since the advent of, you know, going back to amniocentesis and more recently with non-invasive prenatal testing, that, you know, those technologies are used by people who, yes, they want more information about the fetus they're carrying, but also, you know, those provide the impetus for the termination of a pregnancy of, um, you know, a, a someone who could be born with Down syndrome. Those are weighty questions, and they get into issues of, you know, what kind of a society do we want to be? To what extent, you know, are women being pressured by these social, uh, you know, social values and, you know, discriminatory ideas against people with disabilities, which we have changed as a society, you know, with since the ADA in 1990. But nonetheless, I mean, I think it's kind of inarguable that those are very much still there and that often there's an expectation that women will get tested because they will want to know, because they will want to make a decision. And there are many stories of women feeling pressured by those expectations, you know, and also being, you know, worried about taking on the economic and social cost of raising a child that, you know, might have a genetic disorder that is associated with certain intellectual disabilities. So what I hope for around this is there's not one right answer. There's a lot of gray area, but we need to have more conversations, and we've often shied away from those conversations because that Im- might involve bringing in the state and bringing in regulation. So, you know, we have a fertility and genetic technologies, you know, in terms of reproduction in this country that is very unregulated, and a lot happens in that unregulated area that should be of concern to us who care about issues of health, bioethics, and justice. We're going to have to stop it there, although I just will quickly say that that's one of the reasons we're beginning to talk about neurodiversity and ableist diversity and that we have people around us who have various conditions and they are people we love and people we would not give up for anything, which makes us think, I think twice, I hope, about selecting away from some of the traits that they have. So it is it is a conversation worth having. Uh, thanks for having this conversation with us. Thanks to Josh for producing. Uh, thanks to Adam Cohen, uh, Alexandra Minnis-Stern uh, for joining us for the entire show. Uh, and, and thanks also to, to Bob Farwell for the conversation about Connecticut's role. In you, Janet, oh, people, you are the you in Eugenics.